It was 60 days ago that NATO launched its war against Serb leader Slobodan Milosevic. We are taking this action for one very simple reason, to damage Serb forces sufficiently, to prevent Milosevic from continuing to perpetrate his vile oppression against the Kosovo Albanian people. If we and our allies were to allow this war to continue with no response, President Milosevic would read our hesitation as a license to kill. Now, more than 10,000 bombs later, is NATO anywhere nearer achieving its objectives? Tonight, we put NATO on trial. that the NATO airstrikes on Kosovo would be over in a matter of days have proved wildly optimistic. Two months on, as the air war escalates, Slobodan Milosevic defiantly hangs on to power. In the surrounding countries, the tide of human misery is all too clear to see. So far, some one and a half million people have fled their homes. Those in the border camps are the lucky ones. Up to 600,000 are missing or displaced within Kosovo. Whilst few outside Serbia would excuse the evil perpetrated in Kosovo, fierce debate rages over the effectiveness of NATO's response. Tonight, we put NATO on trial. NATO is charged with blundering, ill-prepared into the Kosovo crisis without a viable strategy to achieve its aims, thereby worsening a humanitarian disaster. The trial will examine the collapse of the peace talks, NATO's military strategy, the handling of the refugee crisis, and how the conflict will be resolved. Our studio jury, selected to represent a broad cross-section of the British public, will hear evidence from expert witnesses on both sides before giving their verdict. The team for the prosecution are the feminist writer Germaine Greer, who is a leading member of the Committee for Peace in the Balkans, and the Labour MP Bob Marshall Andrews, a practising barrister and one of his party's most outspoken critics of the war. Jermaine Greer, what is the core of your case? The air war against Yugoslavia is not just pointless and ill-conceived, it's also making a serious situation very much worse. Slobodan Milosevic is a warlord. The last thing you give a warlord is a war, which will justify his paranoid version of events and his abrogation of the civil rights of others. The Serbian opposition to Milosevic is now isolated and much weaker than it was before. And if NATO's aim was to protect the Kosovars from ethnic cleansing, it has obviously failed in that aim. Even if it had succeeded, I doubt whether the deployment of force on such a scale would ever have been justified. We are doing no better in Serbia than administering a punishment beating. Jermaine Greer, thank you. For the defence, we have the writer Michael Ignatiev, an expert on Eastern European history who has just returned from a visit to the Kosovan border. And the former journalist and Labour MP Ben Bradshaw, a leading supporter of the NATO campaign in Kosovo, Michael Ignatiev, your defence. I'm a Canadian, and for 20 years I've made Britain my home. And I love this country. It's a land of liberty, and its people know that liberty is something you have to fight for. Twice in this century, British people have fought and died to keep Europe free. And now in Kosovo, we may have to do the same again. Because two hours from here, fellow Europeans are being massacred, raped, driven from their homes, and forced into exile, simply because of who they are. Now, we've tried to stop this by peaceful means, but there are only two choices left. Voting guilty tonight means standing by and doing nothing. Voting not guilty means you support NATO's fight to stop ethnic cleansing in Europe. And it also means voting not guilty tonight means keeping faith with who we are, 
Michael keeping Ignacio. faith with the best of our country's traditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we begin by examining how we arrived at this crisis and whether diplomacy could have averted the war. Prosecution, will you please call the first witness, uh, who is in fact being called by both sides, Bob Marshall Andrews. Yes, I called Dame Pauline Neville Jones. <coughs> Dame Pauline Neville Jones was political director of the Foreign Office, played a leading role in the peace talks that ended the Bosnian War. Yes, Dame Pauline, those peace talks were the Dayton Accord, and you played a leading role in that. Kosovo, we know, was not a part of the Dayton Agreement, quite Correct. deliberately, that is right, is it not? Correct. Correct. And at the end, when the Dayton Agreement was signed, Kosovo was described by Richard Holbrook as adjourned but not ignored. Mm -hmm. <coughs> was that a policy that you agreed with? I did. Thereafter, we know what happened in Kosovo was that bloody civil war broke out. And up until the end of 1998, 2,000 people were killed and 300,000 rendered homeless. That's right, is it not? Mm -hmm. yes. <coughs> and atrocities committed on both sides during that time. Yes. Did NATO during that period ignore what was going on or did we do what we should have done in that period? Wh which period are you talking about? Uh, the period to the end of 1998. Uh, during that period, um, attempts were made to bring about uh, an agreement uh, and to negotiate with Milosevic over the future of Kosovo, uh, but not, I have to say, I think, in ways which actually were calculated to be effective. Not effective? No. Why not? Because I think there was a following Dayton, where, as you say, it was not uh, on the agenda, and I think rightly not on the agenda, because I think we would not have had a peace in Bosnia, which was much the more urgent item <coughs> had we tried to tackle Kosovo at that time. Uh, that item was, as Dick Holbrook says in his book, uh, uh, adjourned. But what happened, of course, was that certain sanctions were still remained on Milosevic with the object of persuading him, pressurizing him into doing the, what, the right thing over Kosovo, which was actually to give them a proper autonomy regime. Now, that did not happen. I think the weakness in Western policy at that stage was that insufficient leverage, insufficient effort was made between 1996 and 1998 actually to get him to deliver a really good autonomy regime. Where did the responsibility for that error lie? Well, I have to say, I think primarily on the United States. I think the difficulty was that following Dayton, there was not a united effort. That's to say, an effort, Americans and Europeans in particular, but preferably also including the Russians. That did not happen. Therefore, a fatal message of division was actually delivered to Milosevic. Well, I think Marshall that was Andrews, a problem. Thank you very, thank much. very much. Now let's go to the defense. Michael Ignatieff. No, uh, Pauline oh, yes. Jones, we now have the uh, <laughs> right. cross-examination <laughs> from Don't go away, the Dame Pauline. No. <laughs> I have need of you. Hmm. Uh, let's cut to the chase here. You're the only one in this room who's actually been face to face with Milosevic, actually <laughs> talked to him, actually dealt with him. Yeah. Is it the case that the only language at the end of the day that this man understands is the language of force? All he understands is sufficient leverage to get him to make a deal. And I have to say that I think on that, on the, the track sh record shows that, that leverage has to involve the threat of the use of force or actual use of force. And that threat has to be credible enough to persuade him. Now, force can only be justified if all diplomatic avenues have been explored and exhausted. Mm -hmm. Do you believe conscientiously, as a former diplomat, that all the all peaceful avenues have been exhausted in Kosovo? Yes, I think they have. Um, I, th I think it's consistent with what I was saying earlier on, that I think that the effort to, you know, to negotiate with him in a vigorous way was not started early enough. But I think that thereafter, significant efforts were made, uh, culminating in Rambouillet. Uh, but what Rambouillet by then lacked, I think, was a sufficient uh, threat behind them of a kind that he really believed in to get him to sign up. And we should clarify that Rambouillet were the talks in France which were designed to try to win a deal in Correct. Kosovo. Mm. Another time yes, for a question? Yes, go ahead. Some people say Kosovo is a strictly internal matter. What do you think about that? I think that when you get uh, a situation in a country which, is, uh, which has such a degree of obvious injustice in it, and secondly is spreading instability ac across its borders, that actually it becomes a matter of international concern. And therefore, I don't think it is entirely a matter that you can allow the sovereign authority to do or not to do what they wish without any kind of external interest or intervention. 
So that we have a right of intervention here. I think there is a right of intervention uh, when you get to the stage when crimes against humanity are being committed, yes. Dame Pauline Neville Jones, thank you very much. Thank you both, Defence and Prosecution. Now, for the defence, Ben Bradshaw, would you please call your first witness? I call Mark Weller. Mark Weller was legal advisor to the Kosovo delegation during the unsuccessful peace talks with the Serbs which led up to the NATO bombing campaign. Mark, your role goes back in the Balkans quite a bit longer than that. Perhaps you'd explain to the audience here exactly what that role was. Yes, I'm also counsel for Bosnia and Herzegovina in the genocide case before the International Court of Justice. In practice, that means that I have had to go through thousands of pages of official unbiased reports which detail exactly what ethnic cleansing, what genocide means. It means that you are awoken in your village at night, you are being shelled, people drag your father's brothers out of your home, shoot them, you get arrested, you get put into cattle carts, onto trains, shipped out if you are lucky and not killed. So I do have some background in this kind of practice. And do you agree with Dame Pauline that Rambouille represented the end of a very long and ar arduous, but in the end unsuccessful, diplomatic avenue? Absolutely. Belgrade was given a chance already in 1992 here in London at the Yugoslavia conference to attempt to achieve a settlement. There were talks in Geneva for several years afterwards to follow on from that. Then we had, since summer of last year, the Hill Shuttle Mission, which sought to obtain a settlement. All of these efforts rebuffed. And then the final opportunity at Rambouillet. At Rambouillet, we had a balanced agreement presented to both sides. At Rambouillet, the Serbs, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, refused in the beginning to even negotiate on that balanced basis. Therefore, then, concessions were made to get them at least to engage in some sort of discussion. Even these were rebuffed. You're also a distinguished international lawyer at Cambridge. Can you address the legality problem? Because that is one that the prosecution are going to try and claim that this is an illegal NATO action. There is no legality problem. In cases of overwhelming humanitarian emergency, there does exist a right of even unilateral humanitarian action, even involving the use of force where absolutely necessary. Thank Mark you. Weller, stay with us now while you're cross-examined, please, by the prosecution, Bob Marshall Andrews. Yes, do you accept that in 1998 that there was a civil war in Kosovo? There would have been an armed conflict of some sort, yes. Yes, there was, and that conflict was between the Serbian army and the KLA. Between the KLA and the Serbian army, that's Did you right. represent the KLA at Rombue? I represented, no, I represented the Kosovo delegation. Yes. The KLA uh, in 1998 was, was thought by the State Department in the United States to be a terrorist organization. Do you accept that? If that is what the United States characterized it at, uh, then I can't dispute that that's what yes. I've done. I would not so characterize the them federal myself. The Federal Criminal Agency in Germany referred to them as the most prominent group in the distribution of heroin in the Balkan region. Do you accept that? May I ask what that has to do with the fact that the no, you may not. Do you are accept, being Do you accept that this group was, was uh, referred to by the German criminal agency as the most prominent group in the distribution of heroin? I have no way of, of confirming whether or not the German federal system said <coughs> something like that. Do you say that the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia at Rombue was offered a fair deal? Absolutely. It was offered several versions of a deal which progressively came closer to their demands, which they refused. You had the you representatives of the Yugoslav government at Rambouillet and at the Paris follow-on conference insulting the negotiators, obstructing any possible are you aware? Are you aware of Appendix B of Rambouillet, which it was demanded that Yugoslavia should sign if they were not to be bombed? Annex B of Rambouillet relates to the standard status of forces agreement which in all let, kinds, let me, of, which in all kinds of peacekeeping arrangements is provided for. Let me read it to you so that this audience should know exactly what Yugoslavia was supposed to sign up to. Article 8 said, NATO personnel shall enjoy, together with their vehicles, vessels, aircraft and equipment, free and unrestricted access, unimpeded access throughout, throughout Yugoslavia including associated airspace and territorial waters. This shall include, but not be limited to, the right of bivouac, manoeuvre, billet and utilisation of any areas or facilities as required to support training point, operations. 
I think the crucial point to make here is that Belgrade had the entire Paris conference to negotiate on this proposal. They refused to engage in any discussions in relation to it, and therefore it is disingenuous to say that this was a demand that which, had they not accepted it, they would have been bombed. Mark it well was Bob occupation, Marshall Andrews, there we must leave the exchange. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Now, throughout this uh, trial, the advocates will be able to call video evidence to advance their case. Ben Bradshaw, would you like, please, to call your first piece of video evidence? While the international community was negotiating in good faith in the 18 months after Milosevic began his ethnic cleansing in Kosovo, 350,000 ethnic uh, Albanians had already been displaced before a single NATO bomb fell. And the video footage I would now like to show you is of one of the many massacres of innocent civilians, that of Ratchak, which actually happened when the talks in Paris were going on this January. As a layman, it looks like executions. It looks like people with absolutely no value for human life murdering these men who, to me, look like uh, farmers. They look like workmen. They look like uh, villagers who... Uh, who certainly did not deserve to die in this fashion. I don't care what the motive was. Oh. <laughs> well, Jermaine Greer, it doesn't look like the Serbs could be trusted while they talked peace they were killing. There's nothing unusual about continuing in, a, in an evil course of action while you're discussing peace. Uh, we have not denied at all that there have been atrocities committed against the Kosovo Albanians. What we deny is that hurling bombs at Yugoslavia as a whole is going to have any impact on this. In fact, it appears to ordinary people to justify this. Now the Kosovars are being blamed for the fact that Yugoslavia is being destroyed. Germaine Greer, thank you. Prosecution, your next witness, please. I called Bruce Kent. Bruce Kent is vice chair of CND and believes that NATO's strategy is illegal under international law and under the terms of the UN Charter. Uh, Tony Blair has called this a war of good against evil. Can you accept this characterization of this conflict? I don't think many conflicts, if any conflicts, are able to be so divided good against evil. Uh, there are always complications on every side. So our insistence on calling certain people innocent and demonizing other people is just part of the obfuscation going on in this case. The evil being done by Milosevic is perfectly clear, but we have compounded the evil by, under the evil by undertaking illegal action outside the proper constituted authority which we signed up for, the United Nations. And NATO itself is violating its own charter, Article 7 of its foundation document, which is meant to operate under the United Nations. The United Nations is the fragile body we have in this world for peace and justice. And it has been excluded from this, and it has been a disastrous and illegal action under Articles 42 and 43, as far as I'm concerned. Are you concerned about the disproportion between the amount of deadly force being unleashed by us and the amount of force being used uh, by our apparent uh, enemies? Well, their, their force is quite clear what they do. Our force has become, really, as we talked about Iraq, bombing uh, Yugoslavia back to the Stone Age. We've stopped talking about military <coughs> targets precisely. We are flattening things from 15 and 20,000 feet. We are determined somehow to win, and win is going to create a desert out of that area. I'm not saying that military action is always inappropriate. The United Nations is not a pacifist body. But what we're seeing here is action which I think could actually be criminal under the Genocide Acts and undertaken by a body which has no authority so to do. And I think for the whole world, and there are now 30-something wars going on in the world, I think it is destructive of the rule of law. Uh, Jermaine Greer, thank you for the moment. Do stay with us, please, Bruce Kent, for the uh, defence of Ben Bradshaw. Um, Bruce, do you believe that force is ever justified? Yes. Uh, but not in this occasion? No. And why not? Because it's not properly authorised. You say it's not properly authorised, although we've just heard from a distinguished international lawyer. Uh, will you ad not admit at least that international lawyers are divided over with whether this is, this is a legitimate action? No, you I might won't. Not, you might not agree with Mark Weller, but he has quite clearly explained how it is legal. No, it isn't. He hasn't quoted a single fact or paragraph. It is not legal, and the overwhelming opinion of international lawyers around the world is that this action is illegal. What do you think is more important, human rights or national sovereignty? Human rights. Uh, but you object to this because you think it infringes a nation's sovereignty? Because it puts a remedy which is not a remedy 
for an illness makes things much worse, excludes all the, charter for, the Article 41 possibilities of the UN Charter of negotiating both peacefully and with other forms of stick which might have brought this to an end. How do you move towards a situation where I think you and I would both like to be, where human rights is dealt with uh, in preference to national sovereignty? We've just started now suggesting that these Balkan countries might be allowed into the European Union. Yet, what a carrot that would have been if we'd started with that. Yet you don't think this example of the grossest genocide to take place in Europe since 1945 is a good place to start. I think genocide is actually a bad word. I think Jewish people are very upset about it because it is not genocide, horrible violation of human rights. Well, the, the dictionary definition of yeah. genocide is the mass murder of people on the basis of race, and we can quibble yeah. about that. I use the term genocide with no apology. What would you do instead? What would I do instead? Well, I'd start spending the money, and it must be something like 10 billion pounds, dollars now, on the war. I'd start spending it on the, the opposition to Milosevic in Yugoslavia, and that we failed to do. I went round with a begging bowl for the radio station called B B92, the only opposition radio station in Belgrade. Nobody here wanted to support them, but those are the people whom we should be supporting and listening to. Bruce Kent, Ben Bradshaw, thank you very much indeed. One more crucial piece of evidence, the crisis in Kosovo has erupted out of the long-running tensions between Serbs and ethnic Albanians. Here, two leading figures on either side of the debate spell out their rival claims to the region. Kosovo to the average Albanians means everything. It means our life. 92% of people of Kosovo are Albanians. We are not talking here about myths that Kosovo was once, once a, a cradle of Serbian kingdom. What we are talking here is about reality. Uh, Kosovo is populated by Albanians and it's our home. Kosovo is Serbia's spiritual heartland. It's the, the heartland of the religion, the uh, churches are there, the monasteries are there, all of Serbian tradition is there in Kosovo. Any attack on uh, Yugoslavian state sovereignty would be unacceptable, but an attack in Serbia's Jerusalem is the most unacceptable of all. In 1989, Milosevic abolished uh, our autonomy using tanks. He surrounded our parliament and destroyed our autonomy. He destroyed, since that time, everything that was Albanian. He destroyed everything in order to force us to leave the country. And he managed to do that. Some 500,000 Albanians from 1989 to 1998 left Kosovo. The Kosovo Albanians lost their autonomy in 1989 because they abused their autonomy. During the period of that autonomy, Serbs in peacetime were ethnically cleansed from their own country by a minority which was a majority in that area and had been given lots of rights. Genocide is being committed in our country. People are being expelled massively from our country. And the only way to stop that is NATO. And this is the most noble thing that this alliance has done in their history. It's an attack on the same place where the old Serbian state was attacked by the Ottoman Empire. It was taken over then and subjugated by an alien occupying force in 1389. And now, uh, 600 years later, the same issues of sovereignty, of freedom, for the Serbian people against foreign oppression are to be found again. Well, that's the backdrop to tonight's trial. After the break, we look at the viability of NATO's military strategy in tackling Slobodan Milosevic. Shortly after the launch of the airstrikes, the United States president made NATO's intentions plain. Our mission is clear. Tens of thousands of people dead. How can we say we failed in the aims when we're in day 60 of a campaign that whose whose end state we we can't yet predict? Oh, no, was at the Foreign Office for 30.